there. Um, they've got some food. They've got some water. I could take a picture of them. And they're just sitting in there with a stupid hat on. And if we took a very, very up-close picture of my friends, they would look like that. What are they? Yeast. Matter of fact, they are just from the grocery store. Plain old yeast. You can go to the grocery store and buy it. This happens to be Red Star Yeast. Um, you've probably eaten the dead bodies of my little friends. Anybody here ever eaten the dead bodies of my little friends? Anybody here ever eaten bread? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Killers! It's okay. So, my little friends, my little friends, are just doing their thing, and I put a bunch of them in there, and I gave them some food. You know what they're going to do next? They're going to start eating sugar. They're going to start farting. Ew. Who here has ever baked bread? Anybody ever baked bread at home? Or in home ec or anything else? No? I'm going to give you homework. So take a mixing bowl. And you put some flour in it. And you put, we'll make the yeast little red dots. You put some yeast in there. And you put some water in there. And you make a nice dough. You set it in a nice warm place. What starts to happen? It rises. It rises. Why does it rise? Because the yeast is farting. The yeast is farting out CO2, and they're making little bubbles of yeast farts, CO2. And those are trapped by the bread, and so the bread expands. And so it's got little pockets of yeast farts. Really? Yeah, really. Some holes. Yeast farts. Ah, yeah, those little holes are the pockets made by the yeast farts. They are doing what's called anaerobic respiration. Anaerobic means without oxygen. There's no oxygen in that loaf of bread. So they're just eating sugar and farting out carbon dioxide. They're peeing too, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Well, you know, everybody does it. So if we think about my little population of little friends there, if you look real closely at this picture, you see anything weird? What do you see? There's stuff inside them. Well, there's stuff inside them because yeast are actually a fungus. They're a unicellular fungus. Unicellular, of course, means one cell. They're a one-celled fungus that have been bred and kept in captivity by humans for, I don't know, 30, 40, 50,000 years. We've, we've had a long-term relationship with yeast. Um, one, it's a longer relationship than we've had with dogs or cows or horses. This is another species that we've been keeping in captivity, maybe enslavement. I don't know. It depends on how you look at it. And we keep them around. We reproduce them, and we kill them. It's a lot like livestock, actually. Um, some of these yeast are doing something. Actually, they're doing it. <gasps> what are they doing? Oh! So if you look real closely, what, where are the yeast that you see that look a little different? There are these guys, there are these guys, there's that one. So yeast are unicellular, they're one-celled. How do they reproduce themselves? Think back to our bacteria in the beginning of the year. They can do binary fission. They split one yeast into two, and that's probably what's happening here. Um, so in that case, they reproduce their DNA. They reproduce all their little organelles, because they're a eukaryote, they have organelles. And then they push it to the ends of the cell, and they split in half, and you get two cells where there was one. One. They can also do this weird thing called budding. So you all look at your shoulder. Now imagine that for a moment. Thank you for playing along, Mackenzie. You're, you're, you're dependable. Come on. Look at your shoulder, buddy. There you go. Now imagine that one day there's a little lump on your shoulder. And then it grows a little head. And then it's got, like, you know hair and eyelashes and teeth and stuff and then you know within a few days it's pretty much you and then it drops off and walks away yeah. would that be creepy yeah. yeah that's basically what budding is so yeast do this thing called budding and they grow a little lump 
on their side. You can see the little lumps. They don't start off the same size. And then that lump becomes a fully functional yeast and then it drops off. Okay, so we've, we've got our little yeast. Now, let's think about their numbers. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a chart. We've got number of yeast, we've got time and hours, and let's say we started off with 50 yeast. Uh, well, let's say we started off with 25 yeast at hour zero. Now, how do they reproduce? Sexually or asexually? Asexually. One cell is splitting into two, which means that if we have 25 cells, after everybody's reproduced, how many do we have? 50. So at hour one, we have 50 yeast. Well, if they keep this up, at hour two, if they're able to reproduce their entire population in an hour, at hour two, how many do we have? 100. 100. At hour three, 200. we have three, 200. What do we have at hour four? OK, somebody other than Austin. What do we have at the next hour? 800. Well, this is looking rather exciting. We're now off the chart. 1,600, 3,200. It just keeps going. Now, you've seen a curve like this before. Don't say it. Don't yell it out. <clears throat> Write it down if you know it. OK, then we'll, take, we'll go ahead and take Zach's X. What is this kind of curve called? Exfoliation. Expo. Exponential. Oh, you've done this. You probably graphed it. It's an exponential curve. Except for my tongue. I know. Expo. And then. Oops, I had one too many letters. <laughs> Last time I had one too few, so, you know. <clears throat> it's an exponential curve. Do you think the yeast could do this forever? Yes. No. No. Yes, no. We have a difference no. of opinions. Just internally. That's just one person we have a difference of opinions. No. Yeah. yeah, no, maybe. So here's where we're gonna we're gonna cut to the notes and then we're gonna come back to this. We've been talking about populations. Are my little friends in here a population? Yeah, they're all one species, they're all in one place. They're all being affected by the same things. They're all bubbly. There's a lot of fart gas in there right now. <clears throat> They're very bubbly. Um, one of the things that we're most interested in measuring, we said populations are dynamic. They change all the time. We are always interested in if we can measure their growth rate. And that's how much the population changes in a given amount of time. So that's all dependent on how many individuals enter and leave the population. Well, how do you enter the population? There are only two ways. <coughs> Birth or immigration? How do you leave the population? Death or, Death or emigration? Now, in general, we assume that immigration and emigration balance one another. There, there are some periods of time where they don't, but those tend to be kind of rare. So to make sure you are clear on emigration, immigration. We assume these balance. There are, like I said, there are brief periods in the history of some any species where they don't balance. If you are sitting in this room and you know that you have ancestors who came from Ireland, which a lot of Americans do, <coughs> I can bet you even odds that they arrived here between 1835 and 1850. You know why? Because Ireland was emptying itself out into the U.S. at that point. A lot of Irish immigrants actually died in our Civil War, including an ancestor of my mother's. Like, it wasn't even his fight. But they got here and they got into the fight. What the heck? Um, they were emigrating from Ireland. Why? Famine. Irish potato famine. Peak year of immigration <coughs> from Ireland due to the potato famine is 1840. Huge waves of Irish immigrants coming over. Um, they were emigrating out of Ireland, immigrating here. That is a period where emigration and immigration don't cancel one another out. 
They don't balance. We had massive net immigration here. And a place like Ireland had massive net emigration. But in general, those two things balance pretty well. So because of that, we can simplify the growth rate to equal birth rate minus death rate. So what if we have 100 births per year and 100 deaths per year? What's the growth rate? Zero. Population's not changing in size. What if we have... 100 births and only 50 deaths. What's happening to the population? It's 50 and it's positive. That's the important part. It is a positive growth rate. Is the population increasing or decreasing? Increasing. increasing. You knew that. Well, what if we swap those numbers and we have 50 births and 100 deaths per year? Negative 50. Negative 50. The, population, the growth rate is negative. The population is shrinking. So now let's go back to this, our little yeasty beasties. Positive or negative growth rate? Positive, way positive, crazy positive. And you can find the growth rate by looking at the slope of the line. Now, of course, this one's slope is changing, and we don't talk much about that, I think, until probably Algebra 2. But <clears throat> the slope of that line is not constant, but it's always positive. It's way positive. That thing is crazy steep. This population is growing like crazy. We actually talk about this kind of growth in species. There's a name for it. You're going to be just shocked. It's so surprising. Oh, look at that. It's almost like we've seen that word recently. Oh, what do you know? So when we talk about populations that are growing very rapidly, no signs of slowing down, that is a population that is exhibiting exponential growth. And that's what our little yeasty beasties are doing in their little home right now. They are growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. Now, we had some differences of opinion, some of us even internally, about whether or not they could do that forever. No. No. We got a no. We got a couple yeses. We're gonna die. We got some yes, no's. They're going to die. Yeah, but they're reproducing the whole time. So can't they just keep growing the population size forever? can it just keep increasing? So let's talk about our yeasty. So here are our little yeasty beasties, and they're growing like crazy. Did I? And I said they're farting out CO2, right? So they're making all kinds of bubbles in there. Bubbles in the bathtub. Oh, yeah, we can, you know what? That glove has got way too much volume to really show how much gas they're producing. But look at all the bubbles. And if I squeeze this, remember, I squeezed all the air out of it, and there is some actual gas in there. So they are, believe it or not, they are balloons. farting their little, I know I need balloons, but we're not allowed to have balloons anymore, so. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Kids start eating. No, it's a latex allergy thing. So anyway, we've, we've got yeast, yeast farts. Did I mention they were peeing too? Yeah. Yes. You know what yeast pee out? Grease. Alcohol. Oh. Ethanol. Oh! oh! Yeah, you are putting two and two together and you're not even coming up with five. Good. So they're farting out CO2 and they're peeing yeast. Yeah. Now, what would happen if I stuck a bunch of, who here, has anybody ever seen a fish tank? Okay. Do you have a filter on it or some way to clean it? Because if you don't have a filter on it and you just leave them in there, what happens? Die. They die because they use up all the oxygen and they pee and poop under the water until they're in a disgusting soup of their own waste. Hmm, yeasty beasties. Guess what happens if we just let that run till tomorrow? It's going to die they're going to die, they're going to run out of food, and they're going to be swimming in a broth that's got enough alcohol in it to kill them. So naturally, most yeast species, we'll get there, we'll get there. Most, we're going to have a full conversation, you're going to love it. Um, most yeast species die when the alcohol concentration in their environment reaches like, I think it's 9%, but I could be wrong. I think 9% is a more recent engineering feat. So by the time you get 9% alcohol in a solution, 
they die. They can't survive that. It kills them. My husband used to homebrew beer. Does anybody know anyone who has homebrewed anything? Okay. So, when people are homebrewing, what happens to the yeast in the mixture? <coughs> they die. Alcohol concentration reaches a certain cutoff. They die. It's toxic to them. They're dead. Now, people have tried, just like you can breed livestock for different characteristics. You can breed a chicken that lays more eggs. I used to read a blog from a hog farmer in Vermont who was breeding longer pigs. Why longer pigs? More. Two reasons. More what? More bacon, specifically, because bacon yeah. is high profit, and more nipples. So he had actually gotten his herd up to having an entire extra set of nipples, which means two more baby pigs who can get nursed by mama and she can support a larger litter. And he had successfully like increased the average length of his hogs by something like eight or nine inches over 20 years. Like breeding the long ones. Yeah. Eat the short ones, breed the long ones. And so people have attempted and been successful in breeding yeast that are tolerant to higher levels of alcohol. It's just a tolerance curve, think about it. So if you've got a tolerance curve for yeast, and this is percent alcohol, that's, well, that, no, not exactly. So let's say that's your 9% cutoff. Are there any yeasts that are still alive there? Yeah. Absolutely. So if you can take the yeasts that are still hanging on there that haven't been the first to die and you breed them selectively, then maybe your next tolerance curve looks a little bit more like this. And maybe that cutoff is now 10%. I think they've gotten it up to 10 or 11 um, the, and this question was asked in the last class well then what about moonshine that's not a product of the yeast the yeast make the initial alcohol but then it has to get distilled so that's a whole separate process um, but that's just selective breeding you're, you're artificially selecting a species for a characteristic you want just like you can breed cows that give more milk um, beef that convert feed better um, longer hogs better egg laying chickens you can breed yeast that are more tolerant of alcohol in their environment. Now, we're going to murder all these poor little yeast because I'm just going to let that run until they all die, and tomorrow they'll be dead. There will be no more bubbles. Aww. A merciless killer of yeast. Um, I bake bread, too, so I kill yeast on a regular basis. What happens to the yeast when you bake the bread? Yeah, tolerance curve. Again, that's why I said no. tolerance curve. That's why I said no. <clears throat> You're thinking in the bread. Yes. But here we're thinking just in an environment like this. So if we never bake the bread, they will eventually run out of food. If you have a, a, a lump of bread dough rising with yeast power and you just let it go, eventually they will run through the food that they can use and they'll end up with enough alcohol in the mixture that they will die. It becomes toxic to them. So... You know, just like any other species, they have their tolerance limits. Well, then let's go back to our question about exponential growth. Can this go on forever? So, you know, here's our growth. This is sometimes called J-curve growth because it looks like the letter J. Faster the population grows, or larger the population gets, the faster it grows because we're just doubling it, doubling it, doubling it, doubling it. This doesn't usually happen in nature. Question. So this is not something we generally see in nature. When we do see it, it doesn't go on for very long. Because what's going to happen to those yeast, for instance? So here's, here's their growth. What's going to happen when they pee themselves out so much alcohol they all die? Boom. So I want you to go ahead and take your hand. If you're writing, you can pause for a second. This is J-curve in, in a heartbeat. Boom. Boom. Now, come on. you got to play along with my stupid reindeer games. You know you want to. Boom. 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 No? You people are no fun whatsoever. Exponential growth is usually followed by some kind of correction. In the, case of our, in the case of our yeast, nobody's coming to rescue them. 
We could put them in a giant bucket and give them lots of sugar, and we could keep that population growing and going for days, months, weeks. But nobody's coming to rescue them. They're in an enclosed um, container with only a certain amount of space. They're going to pee out so much um, alcohol, they're going to poison themselves, and they're going to run out of food. So it's a, it depends on which kills them first. <clears throat> Those are limiting factors. The exponential growth model doesn't recognize limiting factors. It says, nope, as long as the population's there, it just keeps growing. But we don't really truly see that. Do you remember the megaplate experiment? Those bacteria on that plate did not run out of food. Eventually they would have. But there was a lot of space for them. There was a lot of stuff for them to eat. Bacteria in a lab dish will grow exponentially. Because they've got so much space. So much food. There are a few other species where we see exponential growth, but again, it only usually happens for a short time. Tomorrow, we are going to start a film. We will do one day of watching it, and then you'll have to watch the conclusion on your own. I'll put the link on Classroom, and you can watch it off of YouTube. Um, but we're going to talk about another species that occasionally experiences exponential growth. With that, um, if you pull out vocab, any part Cs that we've now talked about, oh, shoot.